So I wanted to make a video about British culture and British life because I travelled in a lot of places and one of the running themes of those places was ethnic diversity leading to various divides. Obviously in Donbass, it's fairly simple, Transnistria, and um, even in Afghanistan. When I spoke to the Taliban commander, he gave me an answer as to why the Taliban should be in charge, not on jihadist lines, but instead on ethnic lines, that they were true Afghans, and the old Afghans, in his eyes, were not uh, sincere. I thought we'd do a little trip. So I started here in Brent, in a particular part of Brent that is listed as 0.0% white English, and then we're gonna travel across the country to somewhere that is 100% white English, and try and show off all the English culture in between, and what's changed, what's there, and what's not. So, join me. Try and show off what's around. As many of you will know, demographic change in the United Kingdom is considered a sensitive subject, and the typical thing to do is to either pretend it's not happening, or celebrate that it is happening slash happened. I'm going to try to do something new, and just present what is. Because of the immaturity on this subject, in this country, I feel I must add a little bit of an intro to explain what we'll be using for that, which will be the 2020 census data to find ethnicity which is all done by self-identification. For example, in Walney Island in Barrow, 100% of the people reported themselves as white, English, Welsh, etc. This is the only category that has English as an identification, so that's what we'll be using. And where possible, I'll try and list the largest ethnic groups in the areas I'll be visiting. And I don't want this to be seen as an attack on any of those groups that we'll be visiting, including the English, because migration and ethnic data is a matter of government policy and a result of government policy, not individuals choosing where they wish to live. But without further ado, we shall begin with Chapter 1, London. Many tourists, especially Americans, only have enough time when they visit England to visit London, and this is understandable. But when I take a few Yankees around there, as a tour guide, I personally have gotten the same response a few times, which is the question, where are all the English people? So if you are a Yankee, planning on coming around, let this video be a guide to you to understand what people mean by that. We begin our journey in the borough of London known as Brent. This particular neighbourhood is 0.0% English and 82.8% Indian. As a result, the stores here sell clothes in an Indian fashion. The food and the cheap junk is also Indian, and advertising is also Indian. And the use of foreign language is not just in the stores, it is also on the temple, posters, and Indian visa services. But also the culture of this place is rather Indian. For example, the incense store was burning a pile of incense to entice you in. And my personal favorite has to be the repeating voice on a megaphone to advertise your products. I did try to interview some people whilst I was here, but the first two I spoke to, their accents were so thick, I'm not joking, I could not understand them, and equally, they seemed to not understand me, either. This could be a result of the fact that 40% of the foreign-born population of the UK came in the last 10 years, or from the fact that if you live in an ethnic enclave, you don't seem to have any need to leave the mother tongue. Most of the people I saw working were all talking in their own native language to each other. But I did manage to talk to one lady about what life was like living in such an Indian place, and her being an Indian lady herself said that she loved it, which I imagine is the case. The only reminder that you are in England comes from the state apparatus, such as the transport system, and its endless propaganda posters. The most recent one, trying to get people to sexually assault women less by saying mate. But of course, you don't have to go somewhere where statistically there are zero English people. 
In fact, where I stayed the night was a place called South Hall. South Hall is listed as 4.1% English, with 75% of the population being from the former British Raj. Which of course means again the culture is around 4% English, with the clothes, food, and advertisements catering for a foreign culture. But luckily I was able to bump into a chap who recognised me and ask him for an interview to find out what the situation was like with such ethnic diversity. So hey guys, uh, we ran into a local, so I thought we'd ask what life is like in South Hall, which is where we are right now, um, with the ethnic diversity. So, want to say hi? Hi, I'm Lewis uh, Yeah, ethnic diversity in South Hall, it's, it's strange. It's strange, like, once you're in South Hall and you've been here for like a week or so, like, it, it feels kind of like normal. But like, you forget what it feels like if you don't like leave. So like, the moment you leave here, you go to Ealing or you go to like Shepherd's Bush, or you like, just move just like, you know, two miles down the road. Yeah. You realise like how you get climatised to it, how it's like, but then like how weird it is, like oh I go to Bristol, visit Bristol, if I go back to Kent, or I go to, I go down to Brighton, I come back to Southall and I'm just like, rah. Is, is it literally just, oh my god, white people? Yeah, but yeah, literally, <laughs> I'm like, when I see somebody, like, like if I saw like, I, I saw like two white people walking down my road at half twelve the other night, and I was like, hello officer, how are you? And I'm like, alright, how's it going? Like, plain clothes, uniforms, like, just knew straight away they were police officers. In fact, South Hall is so Indian orientated that the tube stop is dual language, with Punjabi next to English on the Elizabeth Line. And as a side note, if you are thinking of visiting London, use the Elizabeth Line if you can at all times. Uh, growing up, I used to think that the London tube system was really cool, but after travelling, especially to the Moscow Metro, it's kind of pitiful by comparison at this point. I mean, for example, if you go on the Elizabeth Line, you'll get such luxuries as air conditioning that actually works. You won't have black snot at the end of your journey. And in fact, you'll have enough room to breathe that you'll actually feel like you're not being crushed to death, even though the aesthetics are pitiful when compared to the Moscow Metro. But if you are in London, the next place to go is definitely the one place where all the tourist stuff is. Westminster, where you can go and see Parliament and Whitehall, with each department being a palace, with English heroes carved into the stone. It's also the best place to find out whatever the current thing is that everyone is arguing about in politics. For example, when I was there, you could find the government buildings flying Ukrainian flags, and some counter-protesters protesting the war in Ukraine. It's also the best place to go and find the memorials to all the wars the UK has fought. But I can't help but expressing that much of this comes across as some kind of ruins of the British Empire, to be frank, and you can further see this in the South African Embassy next to Whitehall, in which you can see Sud Africa carved into the entrance because it is the old colonial building. Such Anglo-Celtic supremacy of the globe is not something you'll find in modern-day London either in the official culture. In fact, if you walk around, you'll see it in the propaganda projects that have been put up. Whereas in Russia, I would see nationalist posters on the metro or on the streets. In London, you will find transsexual traffic lights, intersectional pride flag boulevards, or posters reminding you that wolf whistling is indeed a crime here. Never mind the poems on the underground celebrating colonisation in reverse. Yeah, those are real. Yeah, I don't know what they were thinking either. Which is in stark contrast to the non-English people selling pseudo-souvenirs all over the capital. Whereas they use lots of British flags, and try and give off a sense of patriotism because they know that's what tourists actually want to see. But that's the thing. What you probably associate the English with is something that isn't really in use anymore, and you can see this most starkly in the phone boxes. These days they're all broken, covered with porn, and turd-filled. And in London, that's all you're going to find in them. But if you want a couple of cultural recommendations, I do have a couple. First one is from modern Britain, the East India Company, which was put back together after being shattered into a million copyrights by an Indian businessman who seemingly liked the company. These days it's a very expensive luxury goods store, which sells of course luxury tea and silverware, etc, but they do have very good biscuits. Highly recommend. And if you want a souvenir worth a damn, I would highly recommend going to the antique stores, especially the military ones where, coincidentally, the ones I visited just all happen to also be run by English people. But this seems like a good time to mention, as uh, this wasn't cheap, so if you want to support what I'm doing, you can subscribe on Subscribestar, that's the best way. Otherwise, subscribing, sharing, etc. is always good, and if you leave comments, I do read every single one of them, and thank you so much. Otherwise, I did bring a few small items to sell, like I usually do, 
except the number will be extremely limited because of the fact that things just cost a lot more here. So, get them all you can. And thank you to everyone who has already subscribed. Back to the cultural recommendations, my next one has to be F. Cook in Hoxton, which has been featured as the oldest pie and mash shop in London, and is from the subculture of London English, the Cockneys, which are now basically extinct. They also serve the divisive jellied eels here. I'm not a fan of jelly or eels. To be fair, it's not bad. It looks way worse than it tastes. It's just like eating seafood. After that, I headed over to Whitechapel, as it's the only other tube stop that I know of that definitely has the local language printed on it as well. Local politicians will argue that this is simply a polite nod to the contribution such people have made to Whitechapel, but this place did used to be known for another group that are now gone. I mean, most famously, Whitechapel was known for the murders of Jack the Ripper and the poor that he preyed upon that lived there. In fact, in Lemino's video on Jack the Ripper, the second victim had a child who lived up until 1967 and perhaps their children would have lived to see the demographic change. Now it's people speak their foreign languages, and the stores trying to make money advertise in those languages too. So you'll have to forgive me if I don't believe that it's just a polite nod, and instead is an admission of the reality on the ground there. These are not the only areas in London that have significant foreign culture to the point that it's changed the area. You can also find it in places in the south, for example, in New Malden, which has a high Korean population to the point of finding free Korean language newspapers on the streets. There is also the world-famous Chinatown in the centre of London, but as Steve Merchant has pointed out, this in no way is a town. It's more of a colourful street for commercial purposes. More of a theme park, if we're being honest. This is why I recommend, if you want to see that magical English culture, get out of London. And there are many ways to go, many beautiful things to see, but I had a goal in mind to go to that place that was 100% English, according to the census. So, I'm going to show you what I found along the way, but of course, there's far more to English culture than any reasonable video could actually show. So the next stop was the Shire. Once you start seeing white horses, you will know you have made it, which are all based on one original, ancient design that may well have been a dragon, and it's also impossible to get a good photo of. So here's the sign. But also it's well worth the climb to get to the top, if to see with your own eyes why this island can be described accurately as a garden, and it should give you some sense as to why it's loved. But, first things first, I had to take revenge on London for making me visit it, so cracked up my phone, found the source of the Thames River that runs through London, and pissed in it. For my London viewers, I'm sure you will agree this is just good banter. Most tourist boards will advise that when you head around the Shire, you should head over to Stonehenge, but I grew up next to Stonehenge, I think they've ruined it. I have a much better alternative in mind. Avebury. Be careful. All right, so enough bitching about things I don't like. London. I'm gonna start recommending some good things if you wanna actually see England. So one of the things I recommend, everyone wants to go to Stonehenge, it's a wonder of the world, blah, 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 blah. Now, I grew up next to Stonehenge, so close, in fact, I got free access to the damn thing. And um, personally, I think they've ruined it. It now has a visitor center and blah, 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 and okay, it's more accessible in that way. But you can't go in the stones. It all feels kind of, uh, major touristy at this point. So what I recommend you do is come to Avebury instead, which is very close. Just get yourself a car, drive out of that hellhole they call the capital city, and come and see this instead. As you can see, massive bloody stones in a big circle formation, which is very nice. But also it's actually authentic, in the sense of you can come up, touch the ancient stones for all the damage that does. And the field is not just a field, it's actually being used. And right in the middle of the circular stones, there's a pub and a little shop. 
which is much better than some cushy visitor center that's artificial as hell. So anyway, yeah, come to Avebury and try and pet the sheep, which um, for some reason they seem to be avoiding me today, but usually they're quite nice. Again, just screw Stonehenge. I just, I'm annoyed at going there and you can't touch anything. And there's, there's foreigners everywhere with the little things listening to some talk. It's all fake. For phonies, man. Come here. Look at a sheep taking a piss. That's a real life. Let's go check out the shop and the pub. The two greatest attractions of Avebury. Not the stones, no, it's the pub and the shop. Yeah. Elements. Buy yourself some crystals or some other shit. Oh look, a phone box, this isn't full of porn. Hey, it still works as well. It's amazing what happens when you're not a bunch of city barbarians. You can actually have nice things that last forever. Still takes coins. Flowers. Again, dogs accepted. Basically, if you don't allow dogs in a business that's in the country, um, you don't have a business in the country. So, what the hell is that? Milk bot. What the heck? It's a vending machine for milk. Pound for what's that, a pint? Purchase a bottle from the Blackberry machine and then fill it with milk. Uh, okay. Ah, we have milk. There we are. Get yourself a bottle of milk. If you want syrups, as I said, 25p a shot, add the shot, and then they trust you to put the money in the box. All right, so I was in the pub and um, found this local man and he's going to show me, apparently there is a slapping stone. Right. So there's a stone that you slap and it makes the noise and that makes you feel good. See these little holes? Each one's in a musical note. And legend has it, the druids made records here. Yeah, okay. do you want to try? <laughs> so if you come here, you can have a go at slapping the stones. It's not just a pub or a shop, although that's enough, frankly. So how do you, do you just literally try and cup it? You slap it, yeah. You can definitely hear it. Yeah. I don't know if the camera's picking it up, but... <sighs> Ribbon's on the stuff. <sighs> These rooty trees there, Callum, is a party. Where Tolkien took the inspiration for the Ents. So this is meant to be the Ents from Lord of the Rings? Yeah. There's three trees. <sighs> and lots of roots. So what's the significance of all the... little bits of bands and... ribbons? Um, there's this thing called Pagans, and they come here a lot. And they do it as like a ceremonial thing. But then also you get weird hippie girls from London who come up and do it. The other stones might also have magical qualities. Which one's the fucking stone? What oh, was that? That's on the other side. That's on the other side. Yeah, do you want to go see that one? No, I'm alright actually. So what's it like not having access to Afghani cuisine? Sorry over there. Nah. Speaking of dinner, I did actually purchase one more thing in London. Which of course I went to Harrods and got myself some beef wellington and then went home and ate it in my dinner jacket like every average Englishman. I'll be honest, this joke kind of cost me a lot. Um, Harrods is actually a place for the super rich at this point to just spend their money. So, uh, that hurt. Anyone who sees that. What have I done? After that, I headed up to the small town of Bybury, because how else am I going to prove that the Shire is literally heaven on earth? And to do that, I recreated an image I found online advertising the place.
So here's the thing. This is heaven. Like this is Anglo Tiaboo heaven. The more of this in the world, the better the world. So I mean that's my thing. I know it's become a meme to say like my politics or whatever this is, but yeah, my politics or whatever this is. Build more of this. I presume that says for guests only in Japanese and Chinese. I don't know if the audio picked it up, when I was talking to a lady and getting some cake, she was telling me that the uh, Japanese tourists like to come round because this place has become famous on social media. And one of the problems she mentioned is that they come here and then they don't realize it's a real place where people live. They think it's like a fake village. So that's why there's signs on everyone's uh, gates telling them private land, bugger off. She was saying quite often some Asian tourists will turn up and walk into the houses thinking that it's all a theme park and you is like, no, this isn't a theme park, we live here. Could you bugger off, please? <laughs> but there we go, I mean, that's, that's the thing you want to create, a place so nice the foreigners think it's fake. After that, I headed over to the last real tourist attraction in the area, which is Clarkson's Farm, which is absolutely brilliant. The wait is around one hour and 20 minutes to get into the farm shop. The mud is thick, and I can see why locals hate what he has done to the parking situation on the country roads. Someone even crashed on the way out. But it's totally worth it. <laughs> Yeah. 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 Thank you. Mm. That's very nice. So this is three quid. Totally worth it. Sounds some little hay bales. Not the best view in the world, but don't care. But here's the thing about Clarkson's Farm and Bybury where we just were. A lady was saying that people walk into their houses thinking it's some kind of theme park. Again, this place, it's, it's real. It's a bit odd. It's interesting. It's a tourist attraction, obviously. But it isn't inauthentic, that's for sure. It's not a bunch of Turkish guys trying to sell Union Jacks in London. Been sat here drinking and eating. I just realised, even the food here is based. It's like the Berlin Wall, take a piece home. Also, the Cotswolds you have to drive through are a listed area of outstanding natural beauty for a reason. But I'm not gonna lie, that natural beauty is not natural. As Clarkson showed, it comes from the farmers who maintain that beauty, and they do an outstanding job of it. But after that, the next stop was De North, which meant going past Birmingham, which I would safely say is not what I was looking for. Don't ask me why, I've just woke up in a fucking steaming mood, yeah? Because I live in a shithole! Do you know what I mean? Birmingham is a fucking shithole! I hate the fucking place! I fucking hate it! It's full of dickheads! I fucking hate it! That's why I do my YouTube! I want the fuck out of here! And this is just one of the beautiful analogies in um, Islam for marriage. The man who contracts marriage is a musin. That is, he builds a fortress. And the woman who marries him is a musina, which means that she has come into the protection of that fort in order to protect herself and their morals. We're driving past Birmingham. But firstly, I wanted to do a quick stop off in Stoke-on-Trent. Now, is there anything magical about Stoke-on-Trent? Nah, not particularly. But they do have one of the best regional foods, oat cakes, which they have for breakfast. It's basically just a breakfast wrap. I always assumed Tom Scott had made a things you might not know about oat cakes. Apparently not. So if he's running out of video ideas, there we are. But they are definitely worth your time if you're heading around the north. Yeah, boys. 
regional food, always the best food. In fact, I was just speaking to the owner. He was telling me about the days where they bake everything so everything's ready. The cakes, that is. Uh, wrapping. Sort of like a pancake made out of oats. Anyway, but he mentioned to me everyone eats them seven days a week. But they said they'd eat them eight days a week if they could, which, to be fair, can't blame people. But also, if you want that fairy tale experience, you're going to have to head somewhere, which is going to be a beautiful hotel, and there are plenty of them all over the country. But I didn't want to burn all of my money, so I found one in the north. To get here, you also get to drive through the Peak District, which is cute AF, in my opinion. Wow! I mean, you can't ask for better, personally. I mean, look at it, it's like something out of a fairy tale. And once you arrive at whatever posh hotel you decide, it's time to have the best English dish, maybe in between or in front of a full English breakfast or a Sunday roast for dinner. Afternoon tea. The proper way to tea is, of course, tea. Add milk after the tea bag to establish your dominance as lactose tolerant. Two sugars, simple as. Now for the food, there are some rules. Start at the top and work your way down. First with the scones and the debate about how to eat them. Okay, I can see why people make fun of us now. Cornish or Devonshire, basically jam first or cream. The ones I got were a bit small to be honest, so be sure to get bigger. Then it's down to the sandwiches. Always with the crust cut off whatever fillings you want, but keep it plain. The golden rule in English food, high quality fresh ingredients, that way you don't need seasoning. Then you end with the cakes. No real rules, but really just have the best you've got and keep them small. The selection we got was okay, but I felt like I could do better at home. So I have. We have some tea cakes here, some French fancies, and some Victoria sponge sandwich cakes. Candacula's wife once mentioned that he goes to the fridge, gets one of these plates, fills it with food, and calls it a happy plate before he scuttles back to his computer. So dank if you're watching. Let me know how I did. Big Scottish bass. After pretending I was better than I am, it was time to get back on the road. And I wanted to show people that ethnic enclaves are not just for London. They are all over the country. And there's a semi-famous one in the north known as Savile Town. No relation. So I've come to a place called Savile Town in the north. Just real quick to show people that it's not just London and the surrounding areas that have mass migration. And therefore demographic... Um, Change, I think, is the word I'm allowed to use. We're in a place that is also 0.0% .0 English in some of its boroughs or neighbourhoods. So I thought we'd just go around, see what it's like. So one of the funny things, I believe this area is mostly Pakistani. One of the funny things about that migration, I remember a BBC article looking at the fact that most of the Pakistanis in the UK come from a single place in Pakistan, which is a city called Mirpur. And so they went to Mirpur to see what life's like there. And of course, there's now strong connections between the UK and Mirpur. So they've started building British-style houses in Mirpur and British-style streets with, you know, bins and everything. And then even in the shops, you can pay with British pounds. So, it does seem the culture goes both ways, at least when they get back to Pakistan. Just the wording, in order to avoid causing hardship to our neighbours. So cute. I remember when I was on Pakistani Airlines and, um, the lady on it, like she does the Urdu, and then she spoke English. And the thing she said is like, honored guests for the people on the plane. And I was just like, ah, oh, oh, that's cute. We were chatting to a chap on the way down and he recommended we come and see this mosque particularly. He said it's the big one. Went to the clove store, didn't film it, but the guy in there I was chatting to, um, he told me a couple of things, which is he's not too worried about their kids getting access to English culture to be able to integrate because at least in Savile Town, like the numbers are lower than it is in London, so they don't have the same concern. And he also told me a funny story about how this ended up happening, which is that he said that people would come and find like the English family living near the mosque, and of course they want to live closer to it, so they'd offer them loads of money for the house, more than the asking price. Yeah, sell the house, it's a good offer. So, there we are. One of the things I do like about this place is the architecture. At least for all the houses, is weirdly English, and I really like it in that sense. But yeah, the people and the culture is definitely different. I don't know how well I can film it, but like we're walking around, and most women are wearing burkas. Sorry, not burkas, niqabs. 
Well, there you are. I said I'd try not to bring my politics into it, so make your own mind up. Now, I'm not going to lie, this place was pretty strange. I did manage to speak to a Pakistani chap through his bathroom window after he wondered what the hell I was doing filming a sign. And when I asked him what life was like around here, he described it as peaceful, which for him is probably true. My personal experience, the word I would use was eerie. So I left a little bit early and it's not just the eerie vibes, but there's a little bit of history around here, which makes everything a little bit more awkward. The towns nearby are Huddersfield, Rochdale, Rotherham, Halifax, Bradford. All of these places have had disproportionate problems with sex crimes disproportionately committed by Pakistani Muslims. And as a result, English-Pakistani relations are pretty awful, with the English population distrusting the Pakistani one, and, what well, I can only assume, the Pakistani population being pretty miffed that they're all being tarred with the same brush when only a small percentage have been convicted of these crimes. But that's just the context. This is a uh, scandal which a lot of people don't want to talk about in the UK, but if I didn't tell you, you'd be ignorant of reality. So there we are. But getting back on the road, because I wanted to go to Blackpool, the Paris of the North. And to be honest, I was very impressed. As you drive into Blackpool, there are signs up saying Blackpool is back, which is a reference to the fact that Blackpool, once upon a time in the 1800s, was actually the top tourist destination and became a hub of tourism for English people on holiday. But with the invention of the plane, where you can now go to Shagaloof and get absolutely sloshed and then have sex with random strangers, people don't really want to go to a seaside town with a cold beach. So it fell into stagnation and became the butt of many a joke. But after being back, it's actually doing pretty good. Driving down the strip, you can see how awesome it is, with fairy tale pony rides, gift shops with girly gifts for the girls, and ICBM launchers and grenades for the boys. There is also the endless food, traditional rock candy, ice cream, donuts, etc. And of course, because the word bread roll has about 50 different names in this island, I had to have a chip balm for lunch. They're pretty damn good, I'll be honest. There are also carnival attractions of all kinds and are very family friendly. In the pub on the pier, for example, there was a bar for parents to sit down whilst a DJ ran a show for the kids. In fact, forget trad wives. In Blackpool, they have trad baby stores. So a mate who used to do donkey rides down at Western Supermare. They told me a story that, they're not following me, are they? Uh, hello. <laughs> no, you gotta stay here, I'm not your owner. The whole time I was there, I only noticed something at the end, which is that I didn't see any political propaganda of any type on the strip. And the only place you'll actually find some is when you head off the strip into the more dilapidated parts of the town. But once it was time to go, I headed up to the Lake District to see what all the fuss is about. And it's boring, don't bother. I don't know why it's hyped up so much on every goddamn talk show. Clarkson's Farm's way better, go there. And then I finished up the trip in Barrow by checking into a Weatherspoons, which is not only a pub, but also a hotel. But then I headed over to Walney Island to find this mythical 100% ethnically English neighborhood and see what it's like. Sadly, I was extremely late, so I was really worried that I wouldn't actually be able to go and get fish and chips and eat it on the seaside for the end of the video. But we turned up at the local fish and chip store with like five minutes to close. And the locals who ran the shop had absolutely no problem with that. They decided to take my order anyway. And as the lady was preparing the fish and chips by putting the fish on top of the chips, it split in two. And despite my protesting that this was fine, I didn't care. I was gonna eat it all anyway. 
she decided to make me another fish for free and gave me both of them. I'm not gonna lie, I don't think you'll find that in London. In fact, driving around this neighbourhood towards the end, I finally understood what that Pakistani chap in Savile Town was talking about, which is that peaceful nature of a ethnically homogenous neighbourhood. All of my trips, I have had to note the effect ethnicity has, either in diversity or in homogeneity, and it can bring conflict in the diversity that I've seen, but there is definitely something about a homogenous neighbourhood that gives a sense of belonging that you cannot really put into words. It's an intangible benefit. And also, as the experiment of mass migration into England has shown, it is the decision of free people to end up like this. At least that's what happened in our instance. Ended up making it here on a little island just next to Barrow in Furness, which according to the ONS data, is 100% white English or British, being Welsh or Scottish, but for the fact of purposes, basically English. As mentioned, there are limitations in the data, but that's what it is. Anyway, a bit of fun. I'm not going to hear anyone ever say that culture doesn't matter. It's the only thing that matters in terms of whether a place is or is not of an ethnic group. I think that's definitely true. Starting off in those places in London, or a few places in the north, compared to somewhere like this. I have to say, I had a couple of things um, contested in my mind. I didn't think I'd end up agreeing that the area around Clarkson's Farm is heaven on earth, and the best place on earth, but... If I had to retire somewhere I've been, that would be it. The other thing I noticed that was a bit odd, was you seem to figure out whether or not an area is or is not of an ethnic group, if the people working the shops are of that ethnic group. It's like you start in London and every shop that's selling souvenirs is run by Turks or Pakistanis or Arabs or something. Whatever they are, it varies obviously. Indians and such. But then you come up to places like this and like the fish and chip shop there, just at the end, everyone in there is English, everyone's working as English. It's clearly some family little business doing English food. And I'm so sick of when you live in the South, especially in London, being told that, that doesn't happen or can't happen. They don't want to work, they don't want to set up their things, and it's like, no, they did for years. It's true of every other ethnic group, why wouldn't it be true of this one? There you go. That's England. And if you want to come see it, see it while you still can. Anyway, I hope you enjoyed. If you'd like to see more, please do. If you'd like to subscribe to get more, please do. And uh, leave a comment, I read them all. Otherwise, I'm going to head off because I'm boiling to death in this. Thank you so much. <laughs>